My very special guest tonight is as versatile a man of the theatre as you'd find anywhere in the world. During his lifetime, he's won international acclaim in the ballet as a dancer and choreographer. In the theatre, he's acted and directed with distinction. He's appeared in movies and directed grand opera. And that's not bad for a lad born on a sheep station. This year, he celebrates 60 years on stage, during which time he's forged an impeccable and unique reputation. Before we meet him, here's an example of the dancing style which made him famous. A sequence from The Red Shoes. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Robert Helpman. That uh, film clip we saw there must bring back some memories for you, Sir Robert, because... Well, I was delighted when I saw it that I'm fatter then than I am now. Well, that's right, absolutely. <laughs> and that must have been the first time, that was made in 46, that must have been the first time that you possibly ever saw yourself dance on a film. Yes. Can you remember your reaction to it when you saw it? First time? Uh, well, that's just a little bit of a long ballet, mm. which I did. Mm. You know, I'm very nervous about tonight. Why? Uh, well, I've never been nervous in my life, ever, 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 in the theatre. I, I, I didn't want to fall over when I was a dancer. I didn't want to forget my lines when I was an actor. Uh, but tonight I'm nervous because I'm told that the last talk we had was good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did have two people before me. Yes, you did, that's true. But now, you you're, know, you're on your Todd. I'm on my Todd. Mm. So, if I, and the one thing in life I cannot bear is boredom. Yes. So if I'm boring, just go like this. All right. Um. <laughs> or if the audience would say, boring! <laughs> All right, and if I bore you, you walk off set. Right. <laughs> now, I was mentioning in my introduction there that you've done, what, 60 years now you've been in the theatre. It was only 50 last time. It was, no, last time you corrected me. I said 58, you said 59. Now, let's get it right, so All right. it's 60, 60 years. Right, 60 years it is, right. Um, so let's look back a bit at the very beginning of your life. Who, in fact, was the greatest influence when you look back on the, on the young child helpman? I suppose my mother. My mother was a remarkable woman. Her, uh, her grandfather was a, a, a sea captain in the whaling days in Tasmania. And uh, he settled there, and his two sons, uh, Robert and Melbourne. Robert was my father's, mother's father, and uh, they went on the land in Victoria, and then finally Robert moved to South Australia on a sheep station uh, called Man Mount Chank, where my mother was born and I was born. What, but what made her remarkable? In what sense? Well, she was very strong. She was, uh, uh, she wanted to be an actress desperately wanted to be an actress, I see now. And when I was a little baby, she used to act for me. And she taught me to love Shakespeare. And uh, when I was in my cot, she used to recite everything to me very dramatically. And uh, I think she taught me to love the theater. How quickly did you pick it up, though? I mean, Very did, quickly, can you, very quickly. Did you, can you remember perhaps the first dramatic line that you ever uttered as a child? I do remember it very well because it was in the days that you used to put 
a thing of, uh, with beads round it over the milkshade. And uh, uh, my mother used to read Juliet, and I thought, no, that's the best part. And I was only about four. And I said, no, no, I'm going to be Juliet tonight. So I got the thing off the thing, put it on my head, and she read Romeo, and I was Juliet. And said, <laughs> I, bet you I look, can't remember the line anyway. I bet you look proper comic with that on your head, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but well, therefore, I mean, were you always dressing up? And it's it just kind of I, fantasy. My whole life was fantasy. Yes. My yes. whole life, right from the beginning, was fantasy. Yes. Um, you know, I, there I was. My brother and sisters were much, much younger. And... Uh, I just uh, lived a life of fantasy, mm -hmm. dressing up, encouraged, of course, by my mother. She gave me endless clothes to dress up in, endless things, anything I want. Did you involve other people in your fantasies, other children? Uh, yes, I did. I had a little friend called Ethne Wilcox. Ethne Wilcox? That's a name, it's a kind Not of enough, name. Yes. <laughs> And she was my great friend when we moved from Mount Gambier to Adelaide. And she used to come down and play with me after school. And I had a, a, a house behind the uh, tennis court uh, made out of an upright piano case. That dates me, doesn't it? For God's sake. Anyway, Ethne used to come down. We used to play these games. And I was 12 years old, and Ethne was nine. And uh, a boy called Jack Builder, now, how do I remember his name? Anyway, he was called Jack Builder. He told me the facts of life. Really? So I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> so the next day after school, when Ethne came down to play, I thought, I've got news for you. <laughs> <laughs> so after a few minutes, I thought, this is the most boring thing I've ever done. Because nobody told me you had to take your clothes off. <laughs> so we started playing other games and we went on and then the next day I thought there must be something more so we started again and uh, mother thought those children are being very quiet and she tippy doed down and caught us. Gave me a belting, sent Ethne home in tears and that was that. Now this became a very favorite story with Fontaine and the whole ballet company. They used to say, oh, tell the story about the piano case and Ethne Wilcox. So I used to tell it. <laughs> it became frightfully boring. <coughs> and then we were in Montreal, being received by the mayor of Montreal and all the grand royal ballet were up on the stage having tea and the mayor was making a very boring speech and, uh, and uh, the public was sitting in the thing, and a waitress kept tapping me on the shoulder saying, excuse me, sir, there's a lady in the hall that wants to see you. She's called Mrs. Stevens. And I said, shh, just me, shh, shh. She said, well, if you, she's, I've got her phone number. If you want it's Mrs. Stevens, she'd like to see you. I said, I don't know anybody in Montreal. Who's Mrs. Stevens? She said, well, if she, if you don't know her as Mrs. Stevens, she was called Ethne Wilcox. And the whole company said, Ethne Wilcox, where? <laughs> and this poor unfortunate woman, charming, charming woman with five children, was brought up on the stage, and I had to tell her. Really? And she said, oh, yes, I always remember it. Very <laughs> was she wearing clothes? <laughs> yes, she kept the clothes on. We, we talked last time, that I, the last year when I talked to you here, about the um, ambition that you had and the way that your father, uh, when you said you wanted to be a ballet dancer, you got you the best teacher available was Pavlova in, in Melbourne, and then you went on to, to London under Saddler's Wells. I'd like to pick it up from there, actually, because um, when you were at Saddler's Wells to start with, of course, you were a member of the Court of Ballet. I wonder what, how it came to be that you were singled out, picked out from, from the, the mob, if you like, and... Which well, uh, at that time, the English ballet was just forming, and, uh, you know, Nina de Valois had been given the, the ballet, and she was... There were no men, and she, anybody who would walk would have got a job, so I could dance. And she thought, well, this is wonderful. So I went to class, and she um, you know, said, I want to give him a contract. And Lillian Bayless, who was a very sharp old lady, she said, oh, well, dear, I have to see him first. Now, I'd learned a trick uh, when I was here uh, with the Cancino brothers. They were Spanish dancers, and uh, uh, they, they used to put a lot of Vaseline on their hair and then dab 
paraffin on, so it shone like, like uh, uh, patent leather. So I did this, and I was in the court of ballet. So Nina said, that's the boy. And she said, oh, no, he's got too much grease on his hair. I can't take my eyes off him. And she said, I think that's his idea, too. <laughs> so she said, well, all right. Give him a contract, tell him to take the grease off. He's got a pretty little bottom anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started. That's how it started. Yeah. And then I became the principal dancer. That's right. Well, I mean, in that time, I mean, you, you became very, very famous um, in, in England. You moved in extraordinary high circles, high, highly educated circles. I wondered what it must have been like for what was, after all, a, a lad from an Australian sheep station moving in that kind of uh, elite English society. Well, they were very strange. I bet they, they were, too. They were very strange. Yeah. There was Sitwells and uh, uh, Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas and Lord Berners. Lord Berners was the most interesting. Uh, just after I got into the ballet, he composed a, uh, a ballet called The Wedding Bouquet. And I was asked to dance the lead. I was told I was going to dance the lead. So he asked me down for the weekend. And uh, so I hired a dinner suit. I'd never met a lord before, and I thought, this is absolutely wonderful. <coughs> so I was met at the station in a Rolls Royce, and driven up to this fabulous house, Farrington House, and taken upstairs. And as I went up the stairs, I noticed that all the um, ancestral portraits were absolutely cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> Said, Miss uh, Phoebe. What, the women uh, as well? Oh, everybody, oh. everybody. <laughs> Cross up. And I thought, well, this is nonsense. And they said, would you like me to unpack, sir? I said, no, 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 because I only had dirty old things. And they said, well, his lordship is in the uh, drawing room having tea, and will you come down? So I thought, well, God, you know, is he going to be cross-eyed too? <laughs> so I went down, and this beautiful drawing room overlooking the spires of Oxford, great drawing room, and here at the end was Gerald Berners, his lordship sitting in this wonderful tea tray, buttering scones and feeding them to a white horse who was sitting on the settee. <laughs> So I thought, well, now this is mad. <laughs> this, this is really gone up the wall. And then I found out, of course, Gerald, who was a wonderful man, was very shy. And so to make other people shy, he always had the horse sitting there. And as soon as I came in, he said, he started. He said, how do you do? You've had enough. Get out. And the horse went out. You know, it was like Alice in Wonderland. I was, <laughs> I was mad. You mentioned there the Sitwells, too, and, and people like that. Again, I go back to my original point. Wasn't it very daunting for you? Um, I mean, you, you didn't have that kind of polish and poise, did you? No, I didn't. But I, I knew about them. I'd read a lot about them, and I, I was fascinated by them. I was in a, in a review of No Cards in which he burlesqued the Sitwells, so I knew all about them. Mm. And I was, you know, I was always fascinated by people who were eccentric. Mm because I suppose I was eccentric myself, I don't know. Did you, did you ever, though, seek advice as to how to better yourself? Yes, I did. Uh, when I first joined the ballet, I used to hear Constant Lambert talking to uh, people like the Sitwells and like Lord Berners and, and about painting and about music, and I realised that I hadn't really... I didn't know anything, so I said to Constant one day, Constant, I don't know. All right, Mr. Lambert, in those days, I said, Mr. Lambert, I don't know anything about anything. Will you tell me? And he said, oh, no, I'm stupid. And about a week later, he came and said, were you being serious? And I said, yes. And he said, well, look, here's a list. I want you to read this. I want you to go to this opera. I want you to look at this painting. I want you to... But then every two weeks, I'll come and ask you what you think. And he really taught me everything that I eventually knew, if I knew anything. But uh, he taught me to appreciate the great things in music, painting, and uh, art. Having done that, and having mixed with these extraordinary people that you've talked about with Sitwell, Alice B. Toklas, Gertrude Stein, and, and Berners, and, and Constant Lambert, um, 
Well, what kind of view did it give you of ordinary people, if you like? Uh, well, you know, one, one, if you went to stay with the Sitfuls, Lady uh, Ida uh, was, um, uh, was sent to prison because she ran up a, a dress bill in Leeds, and Sir George said, oh, well, she ran up the bill, let her go to prison. So, <laughs> <laughs> this caused a great rift in the, in the family. So when you went there for a weekend, there was a huge dinner table, and one end, Lady Ida, who had a long Sitwellian nose, <laughs> and she would say, I hate him. <laughs> and Sir George sitting at the other end like this. And as punishment, if you went for the weekend, at one meal you had to sit next to Sir George. That was the punishment. <laughs> and so finally came my turn and he absolutely ignored me. The chair could have been empty. So finally, after coffee and uh, was served and I said, I'll have a cherry brandy. And I thought, I've got to say something to this man. So I said, um, Sir George, it's, it's delicious cherry brandy, isn't it? I wonder how it's made. And he said, cherries and brandy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Fantastic. You mentioned there that, uh, that you became principal dancer. Um, and again, I mean, it, you had all the adulation. You were a very, very big star and, and a young man. Did you... Tell me, um, have any problems from uh, fans? I mean, because there is such a thing as a ballet groupie, isn't there? It's oh, they were fantastic in those days. They really were. They used to tear my clothes off. Really? <laughs> mm. Not on stage. No, 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 no not on stage. No. There were two groups uh, that used to sit in the gallery: the Coots girls, four of them on that side. <laughs> and the Witherby's girls on that side, and they hated each other, and they used to have a punch-up. It was unbelievable. Really? And one day, Anne Coots even put a thing in and said she was pregnant. To me. Really? <laughs> Not at that distance. <laughs> She, I mean, did she sort of claim a paternity suit again? Oh, yes, yes, really? yes. Oh, it was terrible, terrible. And oh, oh, what did you have to do to dissuade her? Nothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nothing at all? No. 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 All right, well, we won't pursue that. When, uh, when, in fact, did you... Was it about this time, when you became the principal dancer, that you decided to, to uh, add the extra N to your name? Because no, how... no. <coughs> that was Anna Pavlova. She was a great believer in numerology, and she said... Uh, because I was a student, and she somehow was interested in me. I think she uh, somehow threw my father. She was, I don't know how, but she, um, she said, you need an extra letter to your name. And uh, that's how I added the end. Really? It wasn't to make it any more exotic? No, no. no, 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 it wasn't. I mean, the, I mean, the day had passed when everybody had to change their names. I mean... Uh, Alice Marx was Alicia Markova. Right. Pat Dolan was Pat K was Anton Dolan, and uh, of course Margot was Peggy Hookham. That's right. Nina De Valois wasn't called Nina De Valois, was she? No, no, no. Idris Stannis. Yeah. But in those days, the Russian, uh, the Diaghilev insisted that they had foreign names. When did you first lay eyes on uh, Peggy Hookham, or De Margot Fontaine as she became? I can remember it very distinctly. I was dancing Swan Lake with uh, Markova, and this little girl, skinny little girl, was standing in the wings, and I said, um, are you very interested in this? And she said, of course I am. And I said, you want to dance it one day? And she said, yes, but not with you. <laughs> 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 and I don't th then, s shortly after this, Margot left, uh, Markova left, and I don't, I, Mark, uh, Margot was the next partner. And I don't think, I don't think I spoke to her for five years, what apart from rehearsing with her and saying yeah. goodnight or anything. And we never became friends for about five years, and then suddenly in Florence, I said something, we were walking down the street, I said something that made her laugh. I don't know, I can't remember what it was. And we became great friends. And we became, uh, remained great friends ever since. How, how deep is the relationship, Sir Robert, between uh, the, the, the dancers in a partnership such as you had with, uh, with De Margo? I mean, can you describe the, the, the relationship? Well, 
No, uh, it's like uh, I had no relationship with her for five years, although we were very then, by this time, a very famous partnership. Mm. <coughs> I think it became better when we became friends. Mm. Um, it's a very difficult thing. I, I, we reached a point that I could tell as she ran towards me how many pirouettes she was going to do. It's rather like to piece artist, you know. Mm. And Margot and I re rehearsed and re we danced together for 27 years. Yes, yes. There was a kind of telepathy develops between yes. the two of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what about, let's move on now to another aspect of your, of your career in the theatre, that of, of, of actor. When in fact did you decide that you wanted to broaden from being a ballet dancer into an actor? <laughs> well, I was very lucky because when I went to England, Sadler's Wells and the Old Vic were under the same management. And as well as being a, uh, having a ballet school, they had a drama school. So I could do both. And Lillian Bayless, who was an extraordinary old girl, uh, every year you had to go to discuss more money. And uh, so I went in and she said, come in, dear. She talked like that. She said, come in. <laughs> and what you want to have now? And we've done very badly this season. <laughs> So I said, Miss Bayless, I don't want any money. She said, and this nearly killed her. Was <laughs> and I said, but I want to play Oberon in the Midsummer Night's Dream. She said, do you think you can? So I said, yes, I'm sure I can. So she said, oh, well, you'll have to go and talk to my Mr. Guthrie. You'll have to go and talk to my Mr. Guthrie. And that was that. So next day, an appointment was made to give an audition for Tyron Guthrie. Now, I was a little crafty about this. I thought, now, uh, it's much better to give an audition as Oberon in tights. So I pretended that I was late from the ballet class. And I said, oh, Mr. Guthrie, I'm terribly sorry. Do you mind if I take my trousers off? Because I've only got my tights underneath. So he said, no, no, it's perfectly all right. And then I stood absolutely still. And I knew he expected me to do all the, you know. And uh, he told me afterwards he knew perfectly well what I was at anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got the part. So you got the part. In fact, you got the part ahead of uh, Lawrence Olivier, didn't no, you? No, 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 no. Well, he wanted the part. Yeah, he right? wanted the part because by the meantime, he'd fallen in love with Vivian, Vivian Lee. Lee and Vivian Lee, that, that production of Midsummer Night's Dream, Vivian played uh, Titania, I played Oberon, Johnny Mills played uh, Puck, Ralph Richardson played Bottom. It was designed by Oliver Messel and Tyron Guthrie directed. It was wasn't the right-back line-up, was it? No, <laughs> Not it a bad line-up. No. Well, let's, well, we'll come back to that in a moment. But first of all, let's see a, an example um, of you uh, as an actor from somewhere about that period, a film that you made in 46, in fact, with Larry Olivier, which is his uh, production of, of Henry V, yes. in which you play the Bishop of Eli. A nice little scene coming out. Let's have a look at it now. Until 401 and 20 years after the function of King... Paramount, idly supposed the founder of this law. King Pepin, which deposed Kilderic, did, as heir general, being descended. <laughs> Blithild, which was daughter to King Clothair made claim and title to the throne of France. Hugh Capet also, which usurped the crown of, of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male of the true line and stock of of Charles the Great, could not keep quiet in his conscience wearing the crown of France till satisfied that fair, that fair, that fair, <laughs> Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of the lady, of the lady, of the lady, of the lady Ermengar, daughter to Charles, the foresaid Duke of Lorry. The marvellous thing about that was, while I was making that film with Larry, I was also dancing. And uh, I had to leave at a certain time to get back to Leicester Square, to, to uh, they was made of pine wood. 
So Larry came to me one day and said, um, could you wait another five minutes? I need another shot. And I said, Larry, you know, I've got to be back. I'm in the first ballet, the Rake's Progress. He said, well, that's all right, you know, five minutes. So I said, all right. We, I got into the car. I thought, well, I've got a bald head in the Rake's Progress. I've got a bald head here. I can change when I get back to the theater. We got to Hammersmith. Now, you know, that's a long way from Leicester Square. And the air raid sirens went. <coughs> Chauffeur said, I'm going to the shelter. I said, you're going to the shelter? You can't leave me here. I've got to get to Leicester Square. said, that's your problem. I'm <laughs> so I thought, well, what can I do? And I thought, well, there's a direct line from Hammersmith to Leicester Square. And all the lights had gone out. It was completely dark. So I walked down looking like that, you know, bald head. <laughs> blue eyes in. All the lights had gone out, the train came in, and I got in, I thought, thank God, but I forgot that when it goes down underneath, all the lights come on. <laughs> and there I was sitting, looking like that. <laughs> and it's wonderful for the English, the way all, they all just went. That's right, pretend you were. You know, they they are, took no attention. They are extraordinary, aren't they? I mean, they just sit there. You could sit there naked and not at all. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's fascinating to me. I love Australia, you know, and it was wonderful. The year that I was um, knighted and uh, also uh, voted the Australian of the Year, I went up to stay with some friends on a station right up in the north, uh, north of Queensland very near where my father was at Jackaroo. And uh, my host said to me about the second night, he said, well, I'm terribly embarrassed, but uh, they wanted you to speak on the radio tomorrow, if you don't mind. So I said, well, of course not. I danced in every single town, Ingham, Innisfail, Charters Towers, Mackay, the whole lot, before I went to Europe. So I went in the next morning and um, they played The Sleeping Beauty, which I didn't think very appropriate. <laughs> and the mayor of Longreach introduced me, and he forgot my name. Anyway, the result was all right. <laughs> So afterwards at the pub, we were over having drinks, and they were interviewing name Helpman, Helpman, Helpman. And right over in the corner, there was a real old cocky, a real old cocky. So he came over and he said, uh, excuse me, um, you Sam Helpman's son? So I said, yes, I'm Robert Hilton. He said, how's your dad? I said, well, my father died in 1930. He said, oh, thought I hadn't heard from Sam for some time. He said, what are you doing up here, Bob? Looking for cattle? <laughs> You're in no danger of it going to your head, are you? With no, 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 no. And then uh, the, the same year, I went to the... Uh, I was asked to be guest of honour at the Victorian Greyhounds Association. Now, I can't think why. My mother bred Pekingese, but I can't think that had anything to do with it. So I went anyway, and as I arrived, there was a great flurry, and uh, a little man sidled up to me and said, Here, I've marked your card. I only back the ones I've marked, you know. And he disappeared, and I won $200 to put that <laughs> And uh, uh, during it, they said, Ladies and gentlemen, the guest of honour tonight is Sir Robert Elpman, the Australian of the Year. And I saw so I did all this, you know. It was a little bit embarrassing, but never mind. We got over that. And afterwards, in the, me in the members' lounge, uh, there was a supper party. So I was standing there, and a man came up to me. He said, uh, excuse me. He said, I, I don't know much about the ballot, but um, <laughs> my wife would be very pleased if you'd sign her race card. So I said, well, of course, certainly. He said, here, Doris, come over here. <laughs> he said, Doris is my wife. He said, Doris, Sir Robert Elkman, Miss Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a bit now about people who've, uh, who've had an effect on, on your life. You, you mentioned there uh, Vivian Lee, who you met. And uh, I think Elizabeth Salter, in her uh, biography of you, mentions that um, there were two women who had a great effect on you, their beauty and their intelligence. One was she, 
and the other was Catherine Hepburn. Well, Vivian was so beautiful and so exquisite looking, and we became great friends, and particularly before, even when, uh, but even before we played in the Midsummer Night's Dream, but then she married Larry, and, and uh, but Kate was quite a different matter. She was, uh, Kate's the most extraordinary creature. Why? Well, she, everything's exciting with Kate. Every day is an adventure. I can remember in Sydney, <coughs> she came home one day and said, I found a lovely place to have a picnic. So, <laughs> she loved picnics. So I said, where? She said, oh, well, a, a nice man in a truck picked me up. You have to climb over the fence and you sit down the harbour. So, so the next day we all went and we sat on the lawn and uh, it was beautiful. And um, then we climbed over the wall and we went there for several days, you know. And years later, or not so many years later, about four years later when the Caseys became Governor General, May had become, May Casey had become, Lady Casey had become a great friend of mine and of Kate's. And I was asked to add Bulty House for dinner. Before that, we walked in the garden and we turned the corner. And I said, who lives there? And she said, that's Kid of Billy House. It's the Prime Minister's Lodge. <laughs> and we'd been climbing in day after day, all the garden. Kate loved that. She thought it was absolutely divine. <laughs> what did Australia make of her? Oh, their daughter. Well, she was so fascinating. Mm. She's a fascinating woman. You couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't be bored with her because everything's an adventure. Every single thing's an adventure with her. Mm. It amused me when you arrived and you said the things that shout, people shout at you from the audience. What I heard you say before right. the thing. It doesn't happen in the ballet. It only happened to me once. I did a ballet, uh, before I did the play Hamlet, I did a ballet based on Hamlet. <coughs> and uh, the music was very short, so I realized that it had to be condensed, and I based it on, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. So when the curtain went up to make it clear to the press and the public that the play was over, the king and the queen and Laertes were dead, and I was being carried off with my head hanging backwards up the stage with a green light. It was a big success, very dramatic. So about the third performance, a matinee, the curtain, and the child's voice said, Mummy, I don't like that green lady. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. but there was the Hamlet, of course. Let's talk about that for, for a little while, because that, that was very interesting. <laughs> um, it, it provoked one of the the most famous, I suppose, and quoted letters of all time, did it not, to you, um, from a, a member of the public. My husband says that Ham. I loved your ballet. My husband said Hamlet was always ruined by the words. <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> but when you, which leads on to something else a bit. But when you, uh, when you. Um, Devise something like like uh, Hamlet or indeed anybody. Um, where do you draw your inspiration from for the choreography? I mean, uh, do you observe people or? Well, in this case, it was interesting because Ophelia has a mad scene, and uh, it's very difficult because Margot was playing Ophelia, and to make a difference in mad scene with Giselle, there's a famous right, mad scene right. in Giselle, and one day while I was rehearsing, we were playing in Bournemouth. And I went in to have morning tea with, during break of rehearsal, and a very nice, ordinary-looking woman came in, ordered tea, and then the orchestra came in, and as the orchestra started, she took off her gloves, and she had red gloves underneath. <laughs> and as the music played, she did this, and when the music stopped, she had her tea. So I said to Marco, you've got to come tomorrow. I've seen Ophelia. <laughs> and that's how, so that's how the mad scene in Hamlet became what it was. Did you ever inquire of the woman? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know laughing at that, so that's not funny. Yes, I did. I found out that she had been in love with a singer and he was shot by his wife and, uh, it had given her a nervous breakdown, so ever when she heard music, she had this terrible guilt thing of separating her hands, which apparently is a very common 
uh, psychological thing. I, di I didn't have any baby to gave a... It was a wonderful mad scene. Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> extraordinary. Also, of course, one other ballet that you did, um, going back to Katie Hepburn, in fact, was a ballet that you devised here, was it not, um, which you uh, dedicated to her, which well, is I called The you, Display. I tell you why, because Kate read a book called The Miracle of the Dandelions, and it was a fascinating book about the lyre birds, about an extraordinary woman who had no sort of affiliation with the lyre birds, and she was determined when we went to Melbourne to see the lyre birds, and I said, but Kate, this was not the time. And she said, oh, yes, it is. It certainly is. Dusk or dawn? Well, dusk was out of the question because we had to perform. So sleeping bags were bought, and we used to go out to Sherbrooke Forest in July <laughs> and sleep there. And finally, we saw the lyrebirds. Now, I had never seen a lyrebird. I didn't know what a lyrebird was. So when it came to, when they asked me to do a ballet for the Australian ballet, the original ballet I did. I thought of the lyre bird because there's no other bird in the world that dances to that extent. But like what? what well, I mean, it, it, when the when its poor unfortunate mate is sitting on its egg, it performs the dance, and it's always the same dance. Oh, she must say, I wish to Christ it get in there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always the same dance. Really? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I used to watch this day after day, and then there was a film taken of it. In fact, the dance in the ballet was the, uh, the actual dance that the bird does. Uh -huh. Three steps forward, jump, three steps forward, jump, three steps forward. Oh, dear. <laughs> did, uh, you also sought the help of Mr. Ron Barassi, did you not? Uh, well, uh, the lyrebirds were in Sherbrooke Forest, so I wanted... The, it was all happened during a picnic, so I realised that it had to be Victorian rules. And I hadn't been in Australia for years, so I did uh, 30 years. So I said, who's the most f fascinating uh, uh, football player? And they said, Ron Barassi. So I said, ring him up, get him in. I want him to teach the corps de ballet uh, how to do uh, passing the ball. You know, you mustn't throw it, you must punch it and all that sort of thing. I didn't know. Anyway, he came in and he was absolutely wonderful. In fact, he was... Uh, fascinated with the ballet and took a lot of exercises back for them to do at their uh, training. Well, well I, I remember Manchester United about uh, 10 years ago, uh, George Best told me, they, they went to a, a ballet class yes. to, and, and they were absolutely knackered after five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so, oh, no, they they, they, they some, couldn't get through the five minutes of oh, the warm-up. Of course not. Some of the footballers from uh, uh, Ron Barassi sent in, but they couldn't get past the bar. They were just absolutely exhausted. It's very difficult. Have you, ever, have you ever had that before, that, that sort of thing where um, uh, men, playing to a group of men, they thought that, that it was all sissy until they tried the act? Oh, yes, we did it all through the war. Every yeah. time we went, they all said, ah, oh, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we asked all the physical instructors to join us at class. They never got through one. Never got through one. Never. Yeah. You said also, but going back to the display, you said that that ballet was a comment on your own life. In what way? I didn't realise the character in it was the outsider, a man who went against the norm. And and wasn't until about the dress rehearsal, I suddenly thought, this is not about a liar, but it's about me. It's about somebody who defies convention and gets beaten up. And in a, in a way, that's what it was. But how on earth have you got beaten up, Sir Robert? Well, not beaten up physically. No, no, I, 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 I take that uh, in another Mentally, way. you oh. know, but at that time, when I left Australia, I was out, you know, out. I mean, there were children not allowed to speak to me in, uh, in uh, Adelaide because I went on the stage. Oh, no. Really? And when I became the director of the Adelaide Festival, I was taken <laughs> to the... Adelaide Club, and it was like the second coming when I came in. <laughs> and one of the waitresses said, can I have your autograph? I said, don't ask for it, dear. I'll give it to you later. You'll get the sack tomorrow. And it was, it, you know, it's really so cut and dry. Is that a, is that a sort of scar you bear? Not now. Not now. I don't care now. At my age? No. Won't be long.
<laughs> Nonsense. You look younger, I think. <laughs> you look 12 months younger this year than you did last year, actually. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do I? That's very nice of you, thank you. Yes. Uh, you're never coy about compliments, actually, Sir Robert. No, no, no. no, no. Now, let's go back to the, to the Australian Ballet, because um, one of the significant things that you did in the early 1970s was you, you got Rudolf Nureyev over here to produce Don Quixote. Mm. Um, what, in fact, prompted that? Sir? Well, I tell you, that was the year that I was to become the director of the Adelaide Festival. And I'd approached the Royal Shakespeare, the Royal Com Com Cambodian Ballet, the Royal Thai Ballet, <coughs> Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce. And I was the director of the Australian Ballet, so naturally I wanted them to produce something equally as important. And Urev at that time was, of course, the top uh, dancer, so I asked Rudy to come out to correct Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. All right, then, well, let's have a reminder of, of that ballet, which we've got here on film, which, in fact, it's uh, um, a sequence featuring yourself in oh, rather good. a marvellous sword fight. Here we are, it's coming up now. How important, actually, in, uh, in the history of, of dance is Nureyev, do you think? Well, he was a great, great technician. Uh, tremendous. Uh, one of the great technicians. And influenced, you know, when he first came, when he defected first, uh, he was in Paris, and they rang me up and said, uh, this boy had just defected and would I come over and put him into my production of The Sleeping Beauty that was on there. And I went over and they said, you've got to be very careful. He's very difficult and very rude. And he, uh, so I went in to watch class and it was quite obvious that here was the most extraordinary, wonderful creature. And so I said to him, I understand you're very rude. <laughs> so he said, well, Sometimes, sometimes. So I said, I tell you what, it's now one o'clock. There's a plane back to Paris, uh, from, uh, to London at three. If you're rude to me, I'll be honored. Now, do you want to be in the ballet? So he said, yeah. Yeah. So I went back to London after putting him in, he was fantastic. And I said to Fontaine, look, you've got to get this boy over. And she invited him over, and that's how the partnership started. Mm. Is he difficult, though? No, at that time, you see, he was terribly f afraid. Every time a 
taxi stopped or anything. He didn't know what was going to happen. Yes, he is difficult. Mm. Can be difficult. Mm. Oh, most people. But you said when you saw him that, that he was an extraordinary creature. What was extraordinary about well, him? Well, his technique. I mean, his technique was extraordinary. You see, Rudy, well, I mean, I never had the technique that Nureyev had. Because when he approached the role, he approached it purely from the technical point of view. I approached it purely from the dramatic point of view. This was the difference mm. in, in our whole approach to roles. And his... His facility for technique and work was uh, quite extraordinary. Shirley MacLaine told a marvellous story once about uh, she went to see uh, Fontaine and, uh, and Nureyev when they were dancing over in, on the west coast of America, making some the first appearance there. And she said there was a party before the first night. And uh, Nureyev used to appear at the top of this huge staircase every 20 minutes with a change of clothes on. Oh, yes, oh, and, yes. And sweep down. Oh, and yes. Everybody would applaud. Oh, yes. And she went, she and McLean said, at two in the morning, she, even she got sick of it, and she went upstairs to the bedroom where all the clothes were laid on the bed, and there was a huge mountain of mink and sable, oh. and she burrowed underneath it to get to hers, and she pulled it up, and there at the bottom, curled like a dormouse, was and it? asleep with Margot. Yeah. <laughs> She'd go upstairs to bed. <laughs> yes. You're going to... No, no, really, it was a great show-off. Yeah. I mean, that was his great... Uh, attraction. I mean, he sh he he's, he was a show off, yeah. and I think if you're on the stage, it's your duty to show off. Yes, yes, I think that's real things, right? <laughs> Be noticed, absolutely. Well, what are the of the new school who are coming through, uh, Sir Robert? I mean, are there any more as exciting talents as as Nuria? No, yeah. they don't happen often. They don't, you know. You know. Mm. And uh, Fontaine. I mean, well, you know, they happen every twenty years. Every. Mm. 15 years. I, I haven't seen any. I keep away from the ballet. I'm well, going back to the ballet in, in October and November. Doing what? Uh, Cinderella. Uh-huh. Where? Here. Oh, marvellous. And in Melbourne. The ugly sister makeup gets easier every week. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you keep... Are you serious when you say that you keep away from the ballet? Yes, because I think when you've seen the great ones, unless this is somebody absolutely extraordinary, I'm not terribly interested. I mean, I'm bringing out with Michael Edgeley the Dance Theatre of Harlem, which I think is one of the most exciting groups uh, in the world today. They're black, but yeah. they're absolutely fabulous. Yes. Well, you saw them in I London. I did indeed. And they, as you know, they're mm. extraordinary. Mm. Okay, it's an unfair question to ask you, but I will ask you it nonetheless, because you said that, 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 when, that when you've uh, you've seen the greats, who, what would your order be then of the greatest dancers that you have worked with and seen in your lifetime in the ballet? Pablova, uh, Fontaine, Markova, Dolan, uh, Nureyev, Perishnikov, and myself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And in reverse order. <laughs> what, what about what about the um, what about the other the, the, the exponents of the modern dance? So, I mean, think of people uh, popular dance like Astaire and Kelly. Ah, well, that no, they're extraordinary. I would I, you were talking about ballet. I mean, no, no, I, no certainly, I'm no technically talking. Oh no, 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 Fred Astaire is an extraordinary man, and 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 Gene Kelly. I mean, I prefer Fred Astaire because he has great style, which is not uh, entirely in Gene Kelly, to my mind of thinking. Yeah. But I'm not opposed to modern dance. I mean, I'm opposed to uh, bad modern dance. I'm opposed to bad ballet. I mean, Martha Graham is, to me, a great, great... She influenced me more than anybody in the world. But when I go and see ladies doing this in bare feet, dirty soles, I, you know, I think, well, what are they at? What are they doing? <laughs> It was actually, I mean, Kelly defined it once. I mean, he said that the difference between him and Astaire was that Astaire danced like a gentleman and he, Kelly, danced like a truck driver. Well, that's um, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, he said it. I well, it's just true. <laughs> but, I mean, the physical shape dictated, didn't yes. it? I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, Fred was... Uh, oh, Fred and Adele, when they first danced together, was something extraordinary. Mm. Wonderful. Let's talk a little bit too about you and the ballets that you created in your time. Some, in fact, have dealt with supernatural elements. Um, I wonder, have you ever experienced a supernatural happening yourself? I only... <laughs> only once. When we were caught in Holland by the Germans, 
and we were waiting on the coast for a boat to come and collect us. Uh, and it was the most beautiful dawn with deer, and it was uh, magic. And co it affected Constant Lambert very much, and he composed a piece of music called Obad Eroic. And then Constant tragically died, and I was asked to read the lesson. Now, Constant's one hate was organ music. He loathed it. He'd walk out, he wouldn't go anywhere near an organ. So, at his funeral, uh, I was asked to read, and I was told that Louis Kentner, who was a famous pianist, a great friend of Constance, was going to play Obad Eroic on the organ. So I rode to read the lesson, and the minister came out and announced that the organ had broken down. <laughs> so they were carrying in a piano for Mr. Kentner to play Obad Eroic, and he played it. 20 minutes later, the organ was perfect. Now, I don't know, and I thought, Conscience is going to trip me as I come down these stairs, no way. Are you a, a religious man at all? No. You're not? No. No, no faith at all uh, attracts oh, you? Oh, of course. Of course one has faith. I don't know what in. <laughs> I have faith, I suppose. But if you're not a religious man then, uh, and you say that so, so definitely, why in fact did you seek an audience with a Pope in Rome, which you did? Well, uh, he asked the same question. But... <laughs> 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 so, I, so I said, uh, he said, why have you asked for an audience? And I said, well, it was a private audience by accident. And I said, well, I, uh, when I first came to England, I wanted to meet the royal family. And when I first went to America, I wanted to meet uh, the president, and uh, this is my first time in Rome. And so he said, oh, you're a diplomat. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not, I'm an actor. So he said, well, oh, from where? And I said, I've been playing at Stratford. And he said, what? And I said, Hamlet. He said, what did you play in that? And he said, I said, Hamlet. And I thought, put that under your tongue, sir. <laughs> <laughs> your so eminence. <laughs> your eminence. So he said, what else? And I said, oh, well, I'm afraid King John, because King John was the first English king to denounce the Pope. Right. So he said, oh, oh, well, that's rather sad. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> what impression did you gain of him? I thought he was extraordinary. He had this, it was pious, you know. Yes. A long time ago. Yeah. Extraordinary eyes, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. We talked uh, a, a, a lot about the, the dancers that you, you worked with and, and, uh, and uh, who influenced you. But as I said earlier, and it's been apparent as we talked, I mean, you're a man of, of the theatre, of entertainment, actually. I think that's really how you see yourself, as an entertainer, isn't it? Yes, as anything yes. Else. Um, again, looking at influences, looking back, what kind of influence did Michael Bento have on you? Well, Michael Bento was the most extraordinary director. I mean, he was... Um, um, when he told you something, it was absolutely on the nose. It wasn't like these modern directors who said, oh, no, you've really got to think, now what was she having for breakfast? There's a wonderful story about Zena Dare, who was working with one of these modern directors, and after the second rehearsal, he said, Miss Dare, that's coming along well. And she said, what do you mean coming along? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> No, Michael was a, uh, he was a, a, dis a pupil of Tyrone Guthrie's and he had a very strong knowledge of what was false in the theatre, yes. which is very important. Because you directed yourself on stage and in fact you directed <coughs> Robert Donut, do you not, in the last stage ah, performance that Donut did? That was, he was remarkable. Well, I'd like to do to tell me that story, to the audience that story, because I, I, I thought it was quite remarkable when I read it. I mean, because here was a man who was, was sick and very ill. Very ill. He was dying, actually. That's right. Well, he... Um, I said, now, Mr. Uh, Donut has asthma, badly, and it's a vicious circle. The more nervous you get, the, the worse the asthma gets, or vice versa. You know. Mm -hmm. So I said, if he collapses during rehearsal, the understudy goes straight on, don't pay any attention. Go straight on. And we got through remarkably well. But on the first night, about five o'clock, this was his return to the old Vic, and they rang me up and said, Donut can't play. And he was 
magnificent in the role. So I said, what do you mean he can't play? They said, he's in the dressing room. He's having a dreadful attack. So I went down to the theater and I said, Robert, what's the matter? He said, I got, I, I got. You know, it was horrifying. So I said, all right. He said, put the understudy on. I said, no, no understudy. I said, Robert, they've paid to see an actor not a sick man. And he said, get out! I said, you're playing. <laughs> and he played and he was wonderful. Really? Wonderful. But he did die, did he not? Very, he very, very short film. No, 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 he made another film. He did? Uh, Ian of the 16th Happiness or oh, something. Oh, yes, <laughs> the 6th Happiness, actually. Yes. Oh, yes, I added 10 there. Um, is it, do, do you have any kind of a sense of, of mission now, Sir Robert, to, to do to attract more Australians into an interest of the Ballion Theatre? Yes, I think... Uh, I think it's unfortunate that the... Um, that there isn't a great big uh, theatre-going public in Australia. Uh, they don't get much opportunity, and the prices are out of... You know, it's, mm. ridiculous. it's getting mm. absurd. Mm. But um, I think it's important for the country to foster uh, the arts in all ways, and I don't think they go about it entirely successfully. But then, you know, we, now we're getting on to another subject that I must keep off. But, I mean, I suppose one of the things, without going into, into politics of it, one of the quite obvious things, is it's not only true of Australia, but true of most places in the world, if you mention ballet, people run a mile, because if you pin them down, they say, I don't understand it. Oh, well, then there's nothing to understand. You can't understand. I don't understand it now. I know I either <laughs> like it or I don't like it. I see. <laughs> I mean, so what you're saying, in fact, then, it's, it's, it's a gut reaction. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you look at look, the National Theatre, the Royal Ballet, the English Opera, all was born out of a woman called Lillian Bayless, right. who didn't know anything at all. But she did know the people that could make the theatre. And she didn't have one cent of subsidy. Not one cent. And yet, out of that has come this great... Uh, thing you know she but she did she had the talent to know the people who did know she knew she didn't know but she knew the people who did know and you're saying then perhaps if i can uh, interpret for you that you've got the talent here in australia but you haven't got the people who know how to put it together or, yes. or, uh, and you said it i said it yeah all right <laughs> well there's enormous well, talent. <laughs> there's enormous talent here look at the look at the films look at helen morse look at these I mean, look at the endless talent here. You go, it's unbelievable. But I mean, what happens? They do a play for three weeks, and then uh, you know they're serving at the Chevron Hotel in the bar. There's yes. no continuity. Yes, yes. In this country, yeah. which is a terrible shame. Looking back, Sir Robert Fanny, on this uh, 60 years of yours, um, can you in the theatre? Can you? Um, <laughs> can you? <laughs> Can you imagine, in fact, uh, uh, ever having done anything else other than that which you've done so successfully over the past six years? No, I wish I had. I wish I'd been more sensible when I went to school. I wish I'd paid more attention. I wish I had been better educated. You see, I'm totally unequipped for anything else but the theater. I don't know anything else. I'm not happy with anything else. I wouldn't, you know, I can't even make up my laundry list. <laughs> and looking back on those 60 years in the theatre, what have been the greatest moments for you? I think the greatest moment was the build-up of the Royal Ballet. You know, this was very exciting. I mean, with Fontaine and Markova and Ninet Velwa, Ashton, Lambert, it was really thrilling. You know? And we got no money. I mean, in those days, uh, my salary was four pounds a week. The first time I went to America with this great, successful Royal Ballet, I got $150, and Margot only got $100. Yeah. And we were sold out coast to coast. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a very corny question to, to 